Yes, please. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Han, I'm from Japan. And, Japan, uh, right. I just wanted to ask you what's behind the uh, Jamie Trump really took an aggressive stance against Japan. And, yeah. uh, because uh, yeah. the truth says that Japan, as far as I know, I might be wrong, um, as far as I know, Japan is the only country that bears a proxy of American bases on right, the sea. Right. I, I'm talking about the bases in Japan. For instance, Italy is not paying a penny to the uh, American bases yeah. there, for yeah. instance, and uh, whereas we uh, pay yeah. a huge sum of money to the Absolutely. Uh, as to the uh, regarding the expense of American bases in Japan. And uh, another thing is about the American bond Japan still owns. We do have a lot still, of American still. bond, and the Quite frankly, uh, if uh, Japan is allowed to sell all those land, there's no such thing as debt problem in Japan, as a matter of fact. Then it's but there's no yeah. way that we can do that. Correct. Once upon a time, uh, Prime Minister Hashimoto mentioned such possibility, and then uh, on that particular yeah. day, the uh, well, the stock exchange market yeah. went in such a mess. So, uh, but anyway, I just found uh, Trump is aware of all these uh, <laughs> things as a matter of fact sort of thing, or is it just to do with his ignorance or whatever? No, I don't. I'm, I'm just no, I, I know, I know what you're I'm saying. I'm just confused. About I can, I, uh, I can tell you two, side three side answers. Thing. One, Trump is taking the power of the people on his side, mm. not the agencies in the middle mm. or the party. He's bypassing them. That's why he has 28 million followers. He gets a lot of information from them. They send back, just listening post. Mm. He figures out where there is a interest or a spark. Okay? So he triggers that. So his public posture won't be the same as his private behavior behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. okay? We think there's a new alignment taking place to contain China now. To contain China, one nation you need, not Australia, but Japan. So Abe was able to pass law that Japan can be a defense nation now. Mm -hmm. Japan has all the capabilities. <coughs> now they're allowed to commercialize it. Mm -hmm. So Japanese will be one more weapon sellers in the market, despite uh, past, uh, what you call, um, uh, uh, you know, non, 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 non military approach, right? Because Japan yeah, was not allowed. Then why is it necessary yeah. for yeah. him to give the American yeah. people the impression yeah. that as if Japan is doing nothing Very for the sake of America? Of course, of we course. are doing a lot. Very simple. You use the public opinion to bring you to the table to negotiate. <laughs> so I have met a Japanese consul general in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. She's a very smart young lady. Yeah. I think number two deputy consul general. And uh, she is now saying that we are very much in a quandary. What is the real message? Yeah. So what he does is that he says, I spook you. So you jump the gun, right? <laughs> and therefore, you are more in a negotiating mood with me. So behind the scenes, they will have a negotiating posture where the Japanese will export a lot less to America. <laughs> Americans will export more to Japan. Japanese will buy from America, not just other countries. That I'm not so sure. <laughs> Yeah, but, but that's, that's really the forecast right now, right? Yeah. So that's really one side. <coughs> uh, militarily, the alignment will be much quicker and stronger. Yeah. So you have the Israelis on the one hand, which are very important, small. Yeah. Singapore has opened up its Navy <coughs> pier mm -hmm. for the ships to come in. This is against the Chinese initiative of what's called OBOR. Have you heard about that one? One Belt, One Road, massive infrastructure investment into Southeast Asia and bringing five ways, two marine and three railroads, through Russia one, through Central Asia, and through Southern Route, through Pakistan and Kashmir and all the stuff, and that dead set. No matter all the public opinion, and we will spin in India negative publicity to our Chinese, mm -hmm. this OBR, OR, is it, and it's, they call it now Belt and Road Initiative, BRI or something, it's gonna happen. <coughs> Chinese are beyond that stage now, <coughs> in terms of, right? So you now create a whole navigational thing which says within Asia, the trade will rise much faster. Asia is large. European Union crossed about a slightly trillion or slightly less, you know, with the 23 nations or whatever it is, before the Brexit. We are expecting in Asia business alone among themselves, like 
Many Japanese corporations are in China, for example. That trade that takes place, make it there, export it out, will about 1.2, 1.3 trillion dollars. Now you need a highway to do that, right? Then that highway goes all to European markets. So Israel's largest market now is China, except weapons, which is very important industry. India will be one of the largest buyers of weapon from Israel. But Chinese and Japanese will do the same. So Japanese, South Korean, Singapore, and uh, Israel are in alignment pretty much to counterbalance the rise of China. Okay. That's what the politicians or the policy makers are thinking right now. So Japan is in a very awkward position, which way to go, yeah. clearly. And Japan is aging, as you know. Yeah. It's, it's aging uh, much more rapidly than we thought. Uh, China will <coughs> age much faster following Japan. Same process as Japan, export-oriented economy, you know, make it for somebody else. Then you start your own brand names, right, pretty much. And then basically from export, then you begin to have foreign direct investment, you know, as Japanese have done in auto and other industries worldwide. The main, main difference is that the Chinese are gunning for the future, which is Africa. Mm -hmm. So I have a video on Africa. Africa in second half of this century, we'll talk about Africa with the same disbelief as China and India. Because we believe poor infrastructure, you can never become world class. But it's possible. I mean, IT industry has proven it's about 100 and almost $50 billion industry we have created in 25 years. It's very possible. So, you know, so it's very interesting to watch that. Uh, I think the IT revolution, mobile phone, mm -hmm. will bring China to a level we had never imagined and India to a level, not on a PC platform, but mobile platform. Right, right. So that's the transformation. So uh, hopefully that will work out. You know? uh, Japan needs manpower. And uh, can you invite Philippines to do work for you? Uh, as guest workers or citizens. Uh, New Zealand is trapping the same way right now. There is that shortage of labor. America, we need 250,000 nurses today. And no education certification can ever. So we are now thinking about in the bilateral negotiations Trump will have with India, they will allow nurses to come as a special permission. He will declare this is our nation's need. <coughs> Immigration I'm talking about is all Mexicans, you know? But Indians are okay. Did you see he backed up from backed off from H1? Publicly he announces, creates a fear among all Indians. My God, 985,000 H1 visa holders in the pipeline, what will happen to them? Right? They're great earning income for uh, you know, uh, uh, India. But he was just spooking intentionally. Next day he says, I don't mean it. <laughs> Which is a problem when a leader of a nation says, this is what I will do. Next day he says, I won't do it. Everybody worries about that. So that's the style that comes in the way. Reagan was a brilliant orator because he was an actor. He never wrote his own script. In movies, you don't allow that. What you do as an actor is to read the script with emotion, <laughs> which is what he did. This gentleman does not have, he thinks he's a show business personality on television, right? But he's not as smart because he writes his own script, which is the worst mistake you can make in television or public media. He's learning now, by the way. He's reading teleprompter a little more. Uh, so he puts this grenade out on issues that he knows his policymakers are negotiating. <laughs> Just to create anxiety on the other side. In his book, Art of the Deal, he talks about that. How to create confusion on the other side so they come to the <laughs> table and negotiate. And thus he, is, he believes what he does. In some ways, he's a Berlusconi, remember in Italy? A businessman who just went on with his uh, personal life, <laughs> totally uh, irrelevant, you know, what the public says, he survived it. Yeah, I, I was astounded that a public figure like that would be allowed to continue as a prime minister in Italy. You know, he had all of this. He used to have orgies of people <laughs> in, his, in his mansion or something. Fascinating, <coughs> so I think there's something similar here, except we are more Puritan than Europeans. So we'll probably... <laughs> Uh, there, somebody will find something to pull him down, we think, but we don't know. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, Jack, um, the last time we met was eight years ago in Dubai when we visited right. SPJ. That's right. And, That's uh, right. I learned so much from you at that Thank time, you. and uh, it's been very interesting listening to you this afternoon. 
But going back to something you're talking about now and mentioned earlier as well, the difference between what you do and what you say. Yeah. And the difference between policy analysis and <coughs> policy description, right. trying to rationalize ex post yeah. facto what has happened. And, you know, to me, um, President Trump is, is not only a moron, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Trump policy is an oxymoron. <laughs> uh, I love it. <laughs> because, you wow. know, uh, it, it, if, if the, if the, um, if the goal is to create confusion, then you might say he's been successful. Yes. But if confusion is a policy, then, you know, one has to completely turn all the old models of uh, international uh, analysis of any sort, whether it's uh, foreign trade analysis, whether it's uh, right. policy analysis of health education right. or security. Yes. And, um, you know, both allies and enemies uh, in this state of confusion, what has been created is a very dangerous state of affairs. And it's all very well to point uh, at, at, at the, uh, you know, um, 2,000 points a month of the Dow Jones uh, 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 road. But in terms of forming expectations on which to make investment decisions, it's just like walking in the swamp that uh, we were promised was going to be drained. Uh, from Washington, D.C. I, 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 I would have a hard time describing Trump policy in any area at the moment. No, I think... Mental policy, I'm not sure. Right. <laughs> I mean, no, no question that his public behavior may not be the same as policy-wise what they're doing. Uh, we were amazed that he got the tax bill passed despite all the Republican senior leaders just don't like him. Isn't that interesting? Uh, Reagan brought everybody from outside. He thought Washington was too uh, incestuous, you know? People, breeding people. So he brought from California and Midwest. This gentleman has brought people, none, very few from New York, except investment banking side, treasury guy. Everything from the south, okay? Some from Midwest, some. If you look at his cabinet, they're all from South. In fact, quite a few, Georgia even. And some of them stepped down, you know, for uh, flying the plane or something like that. The health minister, for example, uh, which is from uh, congressman from our area, uh, Atlanta. So I think he's deliberately playing the game. Okay, just now it creates confusion, I agree. So here is the analysis. It says, we know the trajectory of where he's going. He's very consistent. America first, make in America, and job something. He has two slogans. Mm -hmm. He's very consistent on that, no matter which audience he addresses, right? Um, the interesting part for his winning, which I have a whole presentation video, the reason why he won is very different than we think besides the whole anti-union, you know, thing that unions were. 2008 economic recession decimated the same white working people who lost jobs. Their wives could not work even in clerical jobs to survive. Uh, 2008, they lost their wealth on housing equity, you know, on the balance sheet. Uh, lost stock market, which has two big pieces on the average person. It's about 150,000 out of which almost, uh, I'm sorry, almost 100,000 or so, and more than that comes, third one is life policy, which survived. Under Reagan, by the way, Savings and loan collapsed, and he said, I will not bail out, let them fail. And he bought out all the savings and loan assets cheap. Uh, I remember in Atlanta, people bought those assets brand new at 10 to 15 cents on a dollar. Somebody else took the risk, right? This guy is doing something similar. The economic recession had a huge impact on people's mindset. Uh, Obama administration could not create the economic spark fast enough. I think he did a fantastic job just to save the nation and the world. If you analyze the data, there are people who have written behind the same things. Uh, I'm an admirer of Obama, personally. But you know, <coughs> Obama looks like an elite person, very well-educated, very 
properly dressed. You will never see him in a kind of a casual dressing, okay? It's very fascinating. Uh, he's brilliant in terms of the way he steps down on the plane. <laughs> Looks like a star, movie star. Uh, this gentleman doesn't have that finesse. Okay? So people are sort of making jokes about him and all that. So, so my view is that, however, he's very clever. Consistency behind the scenes. I'm not pro-Trump. I will tell you that I did not vote for Trump. I don't think I will vote for him again for totally different reasons. So I think this here is the direction. Unilateral or multilateral trade will become more and more bilateral, clearly. From trade, the policy will shift toward investment. You invest in America, Americans invest in you, not just buy and sell. Third thing is that it will go from Europe-centric world to more and more Asia-centric world. <coughs> Look east, everybody. Germans are looking east, Canadian young Prime Minister is looking east, for example. And uh, I have a, I've given speeches on the brighter side of Brexit. Uh, Cameron Gamble, he lost it, but uh, May is a very smart lady, even though there are some issues in, in her cabinet. She is already aligning with America. She wants the divorce faster than the European Union would like to give her, so they will extract money out of her, because she has a sense of urgency. She will align with the Commonwealth nations, which includes Canada, Australia. India will benefit in this transition. <laughs> Surprisingly, one of the biggest beneficiaries with the Trump policy and the change and the domino effect will be India. I think we have got like 60 billion investment. I've been opposed to having uh, financial institutional investor, FII, in the stock market because I can pull the money out in five days. And I can create a havoc with your car stock market, which may have an impact on your currency because black market comes out in the process. And so I've been saying that if you want to invite foreigners, make them stay here like investing, which means they can't get out soon. It's whether it's manufacturing or services, whatever it is, so it's going to happen. Amazon will make major investment here. <coughs> so will be Google. So will be professional services, accounting and legal. But in manufacturing, I think we are the largest small car manufacturer in the world now. China has all. So they buy big cars. We buy still small cars. Maruti is doing fantastically well. It's owned by Isuzu, as you know, uh, the Japanese co corporation. They are, in fact, I think Isuzu executives or um, Indian executives working with it said that they are now thinking that Isuzu's biggest market may be India, not Japan or America, which is a radical thinking. So they are investing heavily, and so Volkswagen will invest here. They have no choice, not just Mercedes-Benz, but across uh, average prices. So this will become very competitive out of nowhere. It will become a battleground, which we have forecasted that the Indian autom automobile makers, other than Maruti, will have an enormous collapse. Just keep that in the back of your mind. I have a theory called the rule of three, you know? Every industry through shakeout merges, three players survive, and we are plotting across industries. But Indian enterprises are investing in our rest of the world. So for example, uh, Adida Birla is number one now in carbon black by buying out a company in Atlanta, Columbia Chemicals, now it's called Birla Chemicals. They bought something in China worldwide. Carbon black goes into industrial use. Uh, they are like number one and number two in flat aluminum sheet business for Coca-Cola, beer companies, you know, very good. They bought Novellis. It is about $14 billion company, just North America. And they have Hindalco here, which is a big one. And now they're thinking about how do you converge the two, not merge necessarily, and how do you make that global enterprise? So they compete with Peshene on the one hand, Korean aluminum makers. They're all worrying about Chinese dominating the aluminum business for whatever reason. So that's really, so it's very fascinating. So exciting world here, right? I will stop. I hope you have enjoyed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Any questions? Anything? Questions. Yeah. If you have questions, we'll take questions now. Yes. Uh, so was Reagan's presidency very really bad for U.S. or for the rest of the world? Yeah. Good point. Reagan presidency had two achievements. 
contra mess, he could not solve it in uh, Nicaragua. He was stuck there. He created the largest deficit budget at that time. He simply said, like he's a Keynesian, you know, in economics, which is unusual. And uh, this gentleman has created even bigger deficit, one and a half trillion dollars, promising the future, which never came to the level. Reagan became, the well, first two years of Reagan were very controversial. Uh, insiders tell me that Reagan actually was lazy. He would rather be at his ranch over there than manage the presidency. This gentleman wants to go to his country clubs. <laughs> there are two different clubs, you know, that was interesting. He just loved horse riding, you know, all that stuff. That was his, in his blood. Uh, managing Washington was not what he enjoyed, right? So that was very interesting. So Reagan created the largest deficit. What happened is that before Reagan came, just out of desperation, President Carter deregulated everything. He hired an economist from Rochester, I think, or Syracuse. Khan was his name. And Khan basically said, we have a big bang theory. Deregulate airline industry completely, trucking industry completely, uh, generation in power, <coughs> separate out from distribution. He tried to create a spark, all the benefit went to Reagan. Obama did all the hard work. <laughs> all the benefit is gonna go to uh, this gentleman. But he will relax regulations, like um, the banking regulation we have, as you know. Uh, he will relax that. Uh, let, let the dogs sleep kind of notion. So bankers are happy with them, you know? So that's the handwriting we see. So I think it's the same thing. Question is, Reagan popularity went after he was shot. People were in a shock. Although we are used to assassinations like Martin Luther King, you know, uh, Kennedy's brother, for example, mm -hmm. but this still came as a shock. And he survived. If you die, you are a martyr, right? But if you survive, people have an empathy toward you. Mm -hmm. And he won that empathy a little more also. Uh, he was very articulate. His speeches were prepared, and his job was to deliver properly. Like the speech in Berlin he did was all written by professional writers. That finesse, this gentleman I think is thinking now bringing those people in his staff. Uh, uh, so that's what our forecast is. So I think this gentleman also will go down in the history as most radical, non-traditional president. And uh, first one like that, but he came from politics was John Kennedy. And in a recession again, uh, 1958, the session was still lingering when he got elected, and he became a hero. He's so young. And so we think that in the next election, if the Democrats are smart, they will select somebody very young. It's uh, Macron, you know, in France. I'd forecasted he will win. Because it's just charismatic young people don't want old people to run for elections anymore. Young people just don't like them. So we have the same, so that's what we think, sir. <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, she has a star power, clearly. I don't think she can win. I don't think uh, any African-American can win short run. Uh, I think, by the way, the real reason for uh, Trump's presidency has nothing to do with Trump, actually. The Republican Party began to learn database management at the cell level, district, which is where the Congress is elected, right? member of parliament, as we call it. And he targeted them, and he was a tireless guy. He will go out someplace, rouse the crowd. Mrs. Clinton did not want to go in those places, even within the Democratic. She, she is not as capable of mass market crowds, you know? She's quite intellectual. I mean, she's brilliant. But that came in the way. So these guys, and by the way, the guy who did all that thing, as you saw in Indian press, was an Indian under H4 visa before Trump. That is why the Republican Party uh, president or chairman was chief of staff. This guy is ruthless. He has pushed out all the people who supported him <coughs> one by one. I mean, have you seen uh, Steve Bannon? Pushed him out from Brightright, Brightright or something, uh, not just White House. So he's gonna do that thing very interestingly. Our forecast is totally non-traditional. Reagan actually brought the extreme right controlling as a minority into the center of 
right of the center, which is where Republicans are, Democrats are left of the center, but no extremes ever win, except uh, Bernie Sanders, which was on the other side. Because young people like the new thing about environment, societal things, you know, uh, health care, <coughs> et cetera. So I think eventually Trump will bring his own party in the center. That's our forecast, my forecast, actually. OK, one more question. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, please. Uh, Narendra Modi versus Donald Trump. Yes. Who do you feel is the uh, better leader and uh, given a chance? Uh, two things. Uh, at least there are two dimensions, maybe a third one. Narendra Modi externally is able to relate to all kinds of personalities. Putin, which is very different individual, to Angela Merkel, who is very different, to before Macron, whoever was there, to Cameron, very young guy, to Obama on the one hand. Now with this guy, Israeli, he relates very well everybody outside. He's a great, great homework he does. So as a politician on the other side, I show you more knowledge I have, which otherwise you delegate to the staff people, right? He's very demanding on his people. And he memorizes. <coughs> and I'm the president, and I don't know my own country's issues. <laughs> see? And it's mind-boggling to see. So far, I have not heard any political leader outside who has basically said, I don't like Narendra Modi. He's probably the best brand ambassador for India we have ever created, except maybe Nehru at one time, you know? Mm -hmm. With Nasser and Tito, non-aligned no movement, he was so sophisticated. And he could rise to becoming, despite the topi and you know, the Indian garb, he could rise to becoming a global leader in many ways. People thought he's brilliant. Uh, this gentleman has proven that he's even more than that because he does hard work. That's one key advantage he has. He is a master at social media. He learned that average public has a lot of word of mouth communication domestically. And they lie with the numbers because you are anti BJP or anti Modi. I wrote an article way back when 2014 election, which I had forecasted, which was unusual at that time. Uh, Narendra Modi, Trump style of election. He related to the average people. No leader in India ever has been a common man. They're all elitist. Mm -hmm. And they have a caste system in their mind. They look down on the poor, please, every one of them so far. Maybe Bajpai might be slightly different, but even that, you can see the body language, you know, pretty much of these people, or their voice you can detect. This guy loves crowds. He likes to say, I was a chai wala. See? Average person, in the movies, if you see, the downtrodden people, if they win against the powerful people, movie sells. And that's what he has, he has a knack of touching that, just like Trump has on the white working class people. But this one has a massive, large following. So we think that he will plan out where he will roll out the elections, like UP election, the way they won, was unthinkable. In UP entrenched thing, he will win. Now, there may be backlash, clearly. Opposition will fight in a different way. Uh, so we are all watching whether he will make it in 2019. Uh, my view is that he will make it. Forecast is that. Momentum is, is in favor unless something happens. <coughs> if there's a world catastrophe of some sort, then we can't predict. You know? so, but that's where I think so. Yeah. Uh, he's brilliant in uh, creating branding. So he's a master at slogans on the spot. So when I meet Congress leaders pretty high level, they actually lament. They say, you know, these were our initiatives. <laughs> Other. <laughs> GST, we couldn't get it done. This guy has slogans for everything. He arouses the crowds, puts pressure on local politicians, and gets things done. So I've labeled uh, here and uh, Narendra Modi as what I call pragmatism. Mm -hmm. While people have labeled him as an ideologue, he grew up with ideology, but he has found what works in politics is pragmatism. He's willing to make deal with Jay Lalita before she died. He knows how to make deals behind the scenes. Uh, my personal belief is that the next thing, if I was advising the party, 
uh, or the PMO office would be to target Bengal. Banerjee is very vulnerable right now. And strong Bengali power under communist regime and now her party is very vulnerable. And that's where you target. Bengal is a big state. Have you seen his policy toward Muslims? Talak, he got it done. Congress would have never taken that decision, I mark my words. So now he's already getting Muslim women on his side. Suddenly he saw they are willing to vote for him, <laughs> despite their husbands. This is interesting, right? So he's trying to do that thing, chipping away, where Congress, in fact, his own view is that what will matter in India as a democracy, which is not sustainable otherwise, is to have a two-party system, or if you cannot pass the constitution change, then de facto two parties. He would like a strong second party, whether it's Congress or somebody else. He says, fighting these little guys is just awful. That's his message. So we think that's what he's going to do. So. Okay? Oh, I'm sorry. Sir, I, the question is not related to the discussion. Sure. This is <coughs> so, uh, you have seen the Indian man management education evolving yes. since 1967, when you were teaching at IIM Calcutta. And how it has evolved, and what are the key suggestions for the young sure. uh, marketeers or marketing faculty? Yeah. Because the gap is still between academy and industry, there is a huge gap. Correct. So how to manage that and research and teaching? Yeah. Some few suggestions. In fact, I had a couple of emails from the young PhDs and young professors who have joined with us to look at accidental scholars and yeah. your story about right. what you did. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Well, thank you. Um, MBA program, PGP, was designed primarily for engineers. Engineers graduated, and they did not know the language of business, double entry system, demand supply, because engineering had no time to teach them basic economics, basic social sciences, et cetera. So rather than society paying for their education, you know, we are very capitalistic. So you put the burden on the government. So you hire, create commissions who simply says, we must make sure these engineers get a business vocabulary. So first year program on PGP is basic. We teach stronger double entry to our become commerce people than we teach to PGP people. We teach stronger economics to BSc people or whatever degree, you know, we give B economics, whatever it is, than what we teach. We're just giving them vocabulary, that's all it is. Now vocabulary has become expensive. Time, resources, I'll come to that. Unfortunately, it changed in America. I have a very good presentation which ASCSB is implementing. How do you revitalize the MBA program in America? We are on a decline. And data clearly shows you, and so, so here is what we did. In the 70s, we allowed non-engineers to come into the management, liberal arts majors, brilliant English guys, because they had no jobs. You know? So they came, now we have a mix of engineers and non-engineers, and you have to learn how to teach them. Then we found private universities were very clever. They found the trend was more and more consulting companies were hiring. You know, 1985, restructuring the economy, you bring in, or re-engineering process, you know, and so you need all these young, bright people. So they began to steer the market to say, we need to have experienced MBAs. So we began to have experienced three, four, five year work experience, all private university cartel, about 20 of them. They meet all the time, and they pretty much pushed it because now I graduate from Harvard or Wharton, and I am now an asset to McKinsey or BCG who are growing enormously, because I can sell their brand name. And they're revenue generators, whereas in the company, as staff people, they are cost centers. Today, 75% of our MBAs go to investment banking and to consulting, which is not what MBA was designed for. We don't te teach them any class to say, how do you become a trusted advisor? Expert for hire is not the future. I mean, Google can do it or artificial intelligence. So we have not redesigned the curriculum to fit where the market is. There's a gap there. In order to grow, we, it's the best graduate degree ever created in America across all disciplines, MBA. Largest numbers have graduated. 
100,000 a year recently, but it was a little less. Average maybe 50,000 a year, really large. Because in other cases, you do your MS, and then you immediately go PhD. And that's a very small population, all other disciplines. So that's very interesting. So then we began to expand to evening MBA. Managers who are working cannot take two years out. We survived on that. Then we created executive MBA. We give a degree, but these are working people, more senior. And we began to morph like that, right, to survive. There are several breakout strategies. Uh, today we go out of our way to get foreign students because Americans don't want to do MBA. So under the guise of diversity, you know, cultural thing, we all we spin very well about this stuff. The deans are master at spinning. Tapan is exception, okay? <laughs> don't, don't look at him, please. But they, they have to, they're marketers. And so that's what they are doing it, right? Um, uh, here are the changes in over there and impact here. Three, four things. MBA won't survive for general management. It has to be an MBA specialized as specialized as MBA in CRM, data analytics. As specialized as branding only, that's all you study. We said that the foundational core can be compressed into two terms in India out of three, release and get more specialization. Specialization does one thing very nice, it basically segments the market. Epson says, are we at an entrepreneurship? They become dominant in entrepreneurship, Harvard now relegates because they want to be general managers. Are you with me? We are plan thinking the same way. What can we specialize where we get a, like a niche market? So they will specialize monopolistic competition, right? As opposed to an employer. MBA is the most costly program we have ever designed in America. Uh, economics are not in our favor. Recruiting is very expensive. There are high maintenance people when they come to the campus. And uh, I mean, selection, admission, and then recruiting is very expensive, staff support. So we are basically making money on our undergraduate programs. All state universities like Berkeley, UCLA, Michigan, Illinois, UT Austin, they make money. This year, UT Austin will have 10,000 undergraduates in business alone. Now we have scale. See? So the, clearly, we are going for specialized MBAs. Europeans are ahead of us, as I analyze that. I have a book called Business School in the 21st Century, Cambridge University Press, where we have articulated this. Uh, the second thing we are doing is experiential learning, not just internship, but throughout the classes. Experiential learning in ISAM, information sciences, operations management, experiential learning in marketing, across all, professors have no choice. How do you build the curriculum so you have a built-in experiential learning, so industry, academic, have to get together on a continuous basis. We are changing second. Third thing we are doing is flipping the class. We are asking professors to lecture on a video. Canvas is the platform we use now, rather than a blackboard. And you put that one up and the students can watch it anytime they want to. And students are more accountable because I have a tracking mechanism on every student, whether they watched it or not, completed or not. You know, like a Nielsen television rating type, right? I can monitor you. In the class, I don't know. They may be absent-minded or they may be daydreamers, you know, the mind will be someplace. And the class is used only for interaction, either on a case or on a dialogue of your concepts to say, and students have to have interaction. So I will just tell you, I wish I've done a lot of work. Education got defined for literacy, from agriculture, where you don't need education, to industrial age, where you need it. So we provided literacy through the platform called Three R's of Learning, remember? Reading, writing, arithmetic. It is now changing with technology to what I've been coining, three eyes of learning, <coughs> letter I, like iPhone. First I is interactive learning. All the scientific evidence in education says that if it is more interactive, they remember more, they retain more. I, I just trust what they say. Education should be actually individualized or personalized. So in a class of 100 PGP, how can each student do something that is, and I can, on the platform, like mass customization, I can do it on digital platforms. And it should be integrated. That means something is common between English and biology. Figure out what it is. 
English stays in English silo, biology in biology silo. We stay in marketing silo. Marketing has no connection with finance. Marketing guys don't know accounting properly except the basic class. So now you have an in integrated education, meta. What is common between English and biology kind of a question, which is big. So integrated education, that's very fast. So we are shifting toward using more digital technology to shift from three R's to three I's of learning. That's, that's the fundamental paradigm. One more thing we are doing is that um, we are, young people are very passionate about how they can serve the society or how the institution they work for are good citizens. So we are now adding, adding courses to be not just a shareholder driven, which is how we teach. Everything is profit maximization, return on investment, you know, stock market price. We are saying that's gone now. How are you stakeholders? What are you doing for employees? What are you doing for customers? What are you doing especially for suppliers? Don't treat them like dirt. They are the value creators for you. What are you doing for the community? So stakeholder theory that came again under tough times in the 85, 86 is now coming back as very, uh, my book uh, with my colleague Rashi Soria, who has gone full time, Forms of Endearment, has now come out with a conscious capitalism movement. 41 chapters worldwide. All the companies are members. It's striking a chord. That you cannot serve just shareholders, that you must serve the society. So Michael Porter wrote a book, he's a good friend, Shared Value, remember, rather than a share, a shareholder value. And he's very influential, so he's socializing the idea. Like Peter Drucker used to be influential on the CEOs of the company, so, which is interesting. So we are shifting that. So our education curriculum is still the same as what was designed with some tinkering way back when, especially the core. Here's an experiment you do wanna watch because I think it's a breakthrough. Wharton will offer its MBA, and they have a huge demand, right? Now, Wharton is a good name. And they have no capacity in the building. So they have first year MBA is all free on Coursera. You pay 35, nowadays I think $70 to get a certificate, right? You have to get a certificate. When you multiply rather than 700 students they you know, invite, now you can have 7,000 students. Multiply $70 or something to 7,000, your economics are in your favor. It's like test writing. Test writing is a money maker for uh, CAT exam, uh, MAT exam by, you know, IMA, for example. Because 30, 40 times people apply, and if you select, right, you make money on the test itself more than the fees. It's the same thing. So they are doing, then now you select, very, so all of a sudden they're getting students, brilliant, from Hungary. Czechoslovakia or Czech and Slovak, Eastern European countries. They're brilliant, but nobody talked to them. And their recruiting guys cannot go out to look at them, you know, like go to the hotel. It's very expensive. This brilliant strategy. <coughs> Why it is brilliant? Because all the top 15, 20 private universities, all well-known, we discount our fees by 50%. So if the fees are 100,000 for two years, actually a student pays only 50,000. We call it fellowships. So these guys say, we don't have to discount second year. They're saving the cost of living only one year on the campus. So you don't have the pressure on your residential in apartments or whatever you do. It's very clever. So they are watching how it is going to evolve. Uh, but it's a brilliant idea. Whoever designed it, uh, my hat is off for that, you know? Uh, very interesting. So there are experiments taking place to make the economics of PGP right. In India, there will be shakeout mergers because you have too many people started with no faculty. And uh, it will be bipolar, which means bigger and well-known respected people will get more and more, and the smaller tail end will die. They will buy out the real estate. As IM expands, right, more campuses with the autonomy of giving an MBA degree, that's going to impact on people who are for PGP. There are issues I like that are happening. It's an interesting market. I can go on, but I want to stop. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.